Accompany me as we heed the words of the prophet Jeremiah and the apostle John. Join me as we investigate the sacred pages of the ancient prophetic text we call the Old Testament in search of Messiah. Hello, my name is C.J. Lovick. Welcome to the third video in the Countdown to Eternity series as we attempt to explore the journey that began nearly a decade ago as I retrace the steps that have led us to these final days in the years 2023 and 2024 that are leading up to the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel that I believe is an appointed time we have and can discover based on biblical revelation revealed in the number prophecies and the prophetic patterns that forecast future events on the Lord's sabbatical 7,000-year prophetic calendar. Based on connecting all the prophetic clear disclosures and the dots provided by the shadow types and prophetic patterns that the Lord has given, we can expect that the 6,000 years of man's toil and labor is going to come to an end on the 10th of Tishri, which is the Day of Atonement, on the Jubilee year of 2031. So how can you possibly know that, you might ask? That's a good question, and you deserve a good answer. In order to understand how I came to that conclusion, I will do my best to set in place the solid steps based on the Bible alone that have led to this amazing prophetic end times revelation. In the last video, we rehearse the headlines in the Bereshit Passover prophecy based on the first six pictographs disclosed to man in the first word in the Hebrew Torah. The six pictographs that compose the word Bereshit is where we discovered the first Evangelium, Yeshua the Suffering Savior, and a timeline that pointed us to the cross of Calvary based on a dispensational duration of time prominently displayed in the last three pictures that are also numbers in what I have titled the Bereshit Passover Prophecy. It is there where we discover that a Savior has been sent from heaven. The numerical revelation moves us ahead in time from sin to the cross of Calvary to the end of the millennial reign of Christ that lasts exactly 1,000 years, completing the 7,000 years the Lord has appointed for mankind. Now, if you have not watched the original Bereshit prophecy video published almost five years ago on Rock Island Book Channel titled The Bereshit Passover Prophecy, now be careful to find the original, which is the one with 1.9 million views. If you've not seen this video, or if it's been years since you viewed it, please pause this video and take the time to view it again, as it will help you understand where you are on God's amazing 7,000-year sabbatical calendar. Now let's do a little review before we take a deep dive into the Akareth Feast of Tabernacles prophetic calendar. Let's make sure we all know the answer to the following question before we move on as I have discovered that much of the confusion that encompasses what I am teaching has its roots in confusion about the sabbatical calendar. And yes, there is more than one. So we begin by asking, what is a sabbatical? The answer is that a sabbatical is a period of time that is divided by the Lord into seven equal parts. Seven days in a week. The first sabbatical period God revealed was based on the first seven days of creation, with the seventh and last day being a special day, set apart from the six other days as a day of rest, a day to cease working, and you are asked to remember that God rested on the seventh day. The first seven-day cycle is the foundational pattern that God uses to disclose several other sabbatical calendars or cycles that we can be confident that this first sabbatical cycle based on the seven days of creation has been faithfully preserved by God himself. Let's look at the yearly feast days sabbatical. God also created a sabbatical cycle of seven or seventh that is contained in a yearly cycle of 12 months. This sabbatical cycle was first introduced to the children of Israel by Moses after the exodus from Egypt and before they entered into the promised land. And of course, Moses was just passing along the new instructions he was receiving directly from the Lord. Now at this point, people become confused somehow, thinking that God replaced the fall month of Tishri, the month that began the creation week, with the spring month of Nisan, 
the month that begins the first feast day of the Lord, starting with the Passover season and the first feast of unleavened bread, and ending with the Feast of Tabernacles exactly seven months later. But God is not replacing the month of Tishri as the beginning of the creation week, as it remains the unchangeable start date for the sabbatical and jubilee cycles. To be clear, the 70th week of Daniel can only begin on the sabbatical cycle that ends with the lull 29 and begins on Tishri 1, the Feast of Trumpets, every seven years, or every 49 years, the 10th of Tishri, the Day of Atonement, announces every jubilee that is always the 50th year after the 49th year that announces a jubilee on the Hebrew calendar. Instead of the creation month of Tishri, God introduced a new calendar that begins with Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread and ends seven months later on the seventh and final Feast of Tabernacles on the Holy Sabbath month of Tishri. So the new calendar that begins with Nisan is actually a sabbatical cycle within a yearly cycle that begins all over again after the completion of one year after the completion of the twelfth month of Adar, that ranges from twenty-nine and a half days to fifty-nine days, depending on when the new moon falls relative to the spring equinox. And that's another long conversation we'll have later. The purpose of this introduction of a new calendar year that starts with Nisan seems obvious to anyone who has given it more than passing thought. God has arranged his seven feast days that begin with the Passover in the spring and end in the fall with the Feast of Tabernacles on a seventh-month calendar that would never be altered. The seventh month was a Sabbath. What is the seventh sabbatical month on this calendar? It's the month of Tishri, the seventh or the end of a sabbatical cycle after which a new cycle begins. The new cycle that begins is the original creation date that starts a new sabbatical cycle that began with creation and will not come to an end until the Lord creates a new heaven and a new earth. So basically, the Lord has added, not subtracted, the Lord has added a new sabbatical cycle. He did not do away with his previous sabbatical cycles. The week of years sabbatical cycle. This sabbatical cycle is based on the seventh division of time the Lord calls a prophetic week of years. In other words, a seven-year cycle that begins with the creation date. Now let's talk about the seven weeks of years that introduce the Jubilee. Just before Israel entered the Promised Land, the Lord revealed a seven-times-seven cycle of years called the Announcement of a Jubilee. Now the word Jubilee was derived from the word Jobel which means a ram's horn. And so it is not surprising that the Jubilee was introduced by the blowing of the ram's horn. Listen to what it says in Leviticus 25, 8-10. And you shall count seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the time of the seven weeks of years shall be to you forty-nine years. Then you shall send abroad the loud trumpet on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement, You shall send abroad the loud trumpet throughout all the land, and you shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land and all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you when each of you shall return to his property and each of you shall return to his family. Leviticus 25, 8-10 The Fifty-Year Cycle Now here is where it can really get confusing. The year of Jubilee, which came every 50th year, was a year full of releasing people from their debts, releasing all slaves, and returning property to those who owned it. God has instituted the year of Jubilee as a foreshadowing of his future work on the cross. This is where Yeshua relieves us of all spiritual debt and our slavery to sin by his death, burial, and resurrection. The Jubilee has a special end-time significance that can only be understood if you allow God to be God and not try and change his revelation to fit your elementary school understanding of math. In a nutshell, the 50 years that follow the 49th year do not change the sabbatical cycle instituted from creation. In other words, you would never begin a new seven-year sabbatical cycle after the 50th year 
as that would totally corrupt God's unbreakable chain of seven weeks of years prophetic revelation from creation. Instead, the 50th year of Jubilee would also be the first year of the next sabbatical cycle. Does that seem strange? Well, so why 50 years? It cannot be added chronologically. It's not a bad question. What does God have in mind with what looks like a confusing wrinkle in the seven weeks of years revelation? The answer is that God has his own revelational logic that often is not recognized until it happens. So when's it going to happen? Well, we will all begin to understand what the Lord had in mind with his 50 years that start a new seven-year sabbatical cycle math. Is that coming up? Yes. The answer can be discovered as we look forward to the year 2030 A.D. Why is 2030 A.D. important, and what does it announce? I promise we will answer this question and reveal other things about the Hebrew calendar that need to be explained in order to sweep the confusion that surrounds this topic away. And by the way, one of the criticisms of this ministry that does not seem to go away is the accusation that what I am proposing must be corrupt because I am using a Roman Gentile calendar. Well, that is completely false, as I always begin with the Hebrew calendar as my only source of dating. The fact that I convert the Hebrew dates to a Roman calendar is simply an accommodation to all our subscribers who would have even a harder time following all this if I took it into my head that I could only be presenting this using the Hebrew calendar dates and the Hebrew months and years. We will be presenting an entire video devoted to how the Hebrew calendar can be easily and without error converted to the Roman calendar. Until then, I would like to rehearse one of the foundational revelations critical to seeing for ourselves what the Lord had in mind with the companion to the Bereshit beginning prophecy. The following will introduce you to the revelation of the Akarith End Times prophecy, the Akarith Feast of Tabernacles prophecy. We read this word, end, in Isaiah 46, 9, and 10, where God says that he reveals the end from the beginning. Let's turn our attention to the Akarith Feast of Tabernacle Prophecies. Reading from Isaiah 46.10 Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, My purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. We have looked at the prophetic perspective in the word Bereshit, the beginning prophecy the prophecy that thematically introduced us in a broad brush stroke the entire 7,000 years of man, the time that's been allotted to man on the earth. A prophecy that identifies when the sin of Adam began, and that began the 7,000-year countdown. The central theme of Bereshit focused on the Son of God who came to be crucified on a wood cross in order to die for our sins, when that actually happened, when that prophecy was fulfilled on the fourth day of a 1,000-year-for-a-day timeline, it gave all of us a historical marker by which we could understand the timeline that the Lord clearly wanted us to apprehend in these last fleeting years of this present dispensation, the mystery dispensation, the surprise-by-grace dispensation, the dispensation that we all call the church age an age that is about to come to a conclusion, as another dispensation is about to begin. Now let's look at the prophetic perspective as revealed in the Hebrew word translated end in Isaiah 46.10. Now let's examine the Akarith, end times millennial prophecy, the prophecy hidden in the Hebrew word translated as end. What is its theme? What timeline does it introduce? The answer is both amazing and confirmational, and a thematic magnification that introduces us to the Son of God who is coming to rule and reign in Jerusalem for 1,000 years. It is the Akarith Millennial End Times Prophecy. The English word end is found over 300 times in the English translation of the Old Testament and 28 times in the book of Isaiah. Of the 28 times the Hebrew words translated as end in the book of Isaiah, there is only one time that the unique Hebrew word 
akarith, that is also translated end, can be found. In other words, the Hebrew word akarith, that is translated into English as end, can only be found once in the entire book of Isaiah, where we find it uniquely placed in Isaiah 46.10. In addition, the Hebrew word akarith, translated end, in Isaiah 46.10, is only found about 20 times in the entire Bible. The bottom line is this. The Hebrew word end, akarith, is used only once in the entire book of Isaiah, and the one time it's used, it is uniquely connected to the prophetic statement that God makes regarding himself. Now let's look at the second witness to the timeline disclosed in the first word in the Bible. But this time, instead of going back in time to the first time the Hebrew word beginning shows up, let's look at the word translated end as it occurs in Isaiah 46.10. Now, the first logical question is, why aren't we looking for the last time the word end in Hebrew shows up in the scripture, and why are we looking at the word as it shows up in Isaiah? The answer to this question is important. As it turns out, the Hebrew word for end as found in Isaiah 46.10 in our English Bible, is not translated end in the Hebrew. The five-letter word, akarith, is translated as hereafter, not end in Hebrew. This is important, as we are now looking for something that comes after the time that the prophecy was written by Isaiah in about 720 B.C. So the first question is, after what? The answer to this question is discovered when you read Isaiah chapter 46. It is there we read and understand that Israel is going into captivity, as the Lord is chastening them for spiritual adultery. God mocks the false gods made of wood, gold, and silver that the nation of Israel is worshiping, as he points out that he alone is the only true God, and the proof of this is that he declares the end. In the beginning, which we now understand means what happens hereafter. Hereafter what? The answer is from the time Israel heard the prophecy in around 700 BC and moving forward in time. In the 46th chapter of Isaiah, the Lord makes a promise to the believing remnant and to the self righteous unrighteous. The unbelievers will be cut off, but the remnant will be preserved and take part in what the Lord calls the glory of Zion. Now, the glory of Zion is not a mystery to the Jews, as they understand this is a reference to the coming of Messiah, where a believing remnant will enter into the millennial kingdom. This is an earthly promise, not a heavenly promise. Israel is going into captivity. That's the bad news. The good news is that God is going to preserve them as their future children will love and trust Him alone and have something wonderful waiting for them. What is that something? So now let's look at the pictures and numbers in the word the Hebrews translate as hereafter to see what we can discover about what the Lord is promising hereafter. The first two letters set the scene and disclose the theme which is both stunning and amazing. Israel, despite its sin, will not perish, although its future as a nation looks to be in serious trouble. No, God makes a promise to a future remnant, the ones that we are told in loving terms, that they are in the womb of Israel. In other words, a future generation are being prophetically promised a place of protection and hope. Now let's look at the prophecy pictograph by pictograph and number by number and see if we can figure out what this is all about. The first Hebrew letter is Aleph. Aleph is a picture of the strong leader. The Aleph is also the number one. Aleph is often a picture of God. It can also refer to the first. Adam, for example, is Aleph Dalet Mem, and he was the first man. The next Hebrew letter is Het. Het is the picture of a fenced garden that is a safe fenced sanctuary. It's also very significantly the number 8, one of the numbers that identify Yeshua, the Messiah. So here we have a simple picture. Is it God in the garden or a man in the garden? This mystery seeks a solution in the Bereshit Passover prophecy, where conspicuous by 
his absence is the sinless man Adam in the garden. The dramatic theme of Bereshit starts with Adam's sin, and the fact that Adam was in the garden sinless for a period of time is presupposed, and it is his sin event that launches the prophetic timeline. The mystery of who is in the garden as pictured by the Aleph Het is found in the Hebrew word that is literally translated into English as hereafter, and it's not left to our imagination. If the Bible is your guide to truth and the fountain of all understanding, then it can only be one man, the God-man, who took on flesh to become the last Adam, the Adam that God's Word calls the quickening spirit. There is only one candidate that fits this picture and only one time in history that we are told it will take place. The Garden of Eden was eventually destroyed in the flood as a result of the overflowing sinfulness of mankind. Does it ever appear again? We are told that the land of Israel begins to look like the Garden of Eden when God brings back scattered Israel and puts them back for the very last time into the land of Israel. In Ezekiel 36:35, we read, And they shall say, This land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. In Isaiah 51:3, we read, for the Lord shall comfort Zion, he will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving, and the voice of melody. To add some other details to the image of the reemergence of the Garden of Eden during the final 1,000 years of Earth's destiny, we discover other scriptural proofs that this is the imagery that God wants to communicate to Israel and to us. Remember, as you read these verses, that the Garden of Eden was a sanctuary for life, and there was no death inside the Garden of Eden until man sinned. Is God going to bring back the garden? Let's see. In Isaiah 11:6, we read, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. In Isaiah 65:25 we read the wolf and the lamb shall feed together and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock and dust shall be the serpent's meat they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain saith the Lord Hosea 2:18 and in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven and with the creeping things of the ground and I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth, and will make them to lie down safely. What is being pictured in these pictographic glimpses of the future? The answer is not a mystery, as all these verses and many more refer to the seventh day, the 7,000th year that ends after the final 1,000-year millennial reign of Yeshua the Messiah on the earth. The theme of the hereafter is revealed by God to Isaiah the prophet, and it's easy to understand as we look at the last three letters that are both pictographic and numeric. Let's take a lesson from the Bereshit prophecy and start with God's multiplier, the Hebrew letter Yod that means hand, doing a divine deed, as it accomplishes something ordained in heaven. Ten, as you recall, is the number of ordinal perfection. Now let's look at the last letter in the hereafter prophetic timeline, Tav. The pictograph that means a sign, and just so you wouldn't miss it, it uses a picture for the sign that is the sign. In other words, the wooden cross sticks or a cross. So we begin our timeline in exactly the same place we began it in the Bereshit Passover prophecy. The cross is the center point, and going back exactly 4,000 years, we arrive at the start point for sin in 3971 the start point for all man's 7,000-year history on the earth. Going back from the cross event, 3,999 years, we arrive at the year 3970, the start date for the first sabbatical cycle that begins the year after Adam sinned. So going back 4,000 years takes us to the year 3971, the year Adam sinned, the year that started the 7,000-year countdown. We now have our first 4,000 years on the timeline. Remember that before this date, and for a period of time that I believe is equal to the days to the number of days Yeshua was on the earth before his death, we have sinless Adam living in a serene, 
safe sanctuary where the lions lay down with the lamb. I believe we can rely on the 4005 BC creation date, which means Adam lived for 34 years before he sinned. 34 years that were 360 days in duration, accounting for 12,240 days. Just to be clear, the time duration between 5 BC and 30 AD, around 33 and a half years. 33 and a half times 365.25 equals 12,236 days. In other words, pattern is prophecy, and the life of Jesus forecasts the sinless life of Adam that began on the creation date of 4005 and ended 34 years later in 3971 BC. Now let's move forward in time and see if we can discover the hereafter that is revealed in the Hebrew word akarit that is translated end in our Hebrew Bible. What end or hereafter was God revealing to Israel and to us? The answer is the end or the hereafter when we find the God-man Yeshua HaMashiach ruling and reigning in a garden-like place located in Jerusalem. We all know what this is about, as it is too obvious and does not require a lengthy explanation. A child can envision and understand it. We look at the end of the final dispensation before the seventh day or seven thousandth year is accomplished. It is foreshadowed hundreds of times in the prophetic word we call the Old Testament, and at the end of the New Testament, in the final book of the unveiling or revelation, we find it not only mentioned, but we are also told so we don't miss the obvious clue that this rule and reign of the Son of God from Jerusalem will last exactly 1,000 years. So does the Akarith prophetic timeline agree with this perspective? It not only agrees, it tells you exactly when it's going to happen. Not perhaps the day or the hour, but certainly the season. This short clip you just watched is from the 2023 End Times video I produced in February of 2023. I clearly had an expectation that the 6,000 years allotted to mankind was going to terminate at the end of the sabbatical cycle after 6,000 years in the fall of 2030. This conviction was based on the belief that the 6,000 years allotted for mankind began with the sin event of 3971 exactly 4,000 years from the cross event of 30 A.D. The expectation for a fall event in 2023 was running at a fever pitch, but long before the anticipated fall event happened, I began to have serious doubts that the 2023 was the year on God's calendar that would herald the 70th week of Daniel, and I began to raise those concerns online. I raised those doubts in my update videos, and the following is the clearest forecast we put on YouTube in late July of 2023, in which we announced that the sin event could not be included in the 7,000-year sabbatical calendar, and the actual start date must begin on the first sabbatical week of years after the sin event. This start date forecasts that 2030 was one year shy of the 6,000 years, and the only solution was the Jubilee of 2031, the year that satisfied the 6,000 years appointed for mankind. So the following is a one-minute excerpt from the End Times Ultimate Update that we published in the middle of July. Going forward 7,000 years from the 3970 BC start date, you land on 3031 AD. Check this for yourself with the date duration calendar. Well, knowing the end date of the millennium is 3031, you can then go back in time exactly 1,000 years and identify the millennium that began in 2031, the reign of Christ, the thousand-year reign of Christ on this earth. Knowing the start date of the millennium, which would be 2031, allows you to go back another seven years in time to identify the start date of the 70th week of Daniel in the fall season of 2024 A.D., in summary, if we go forward from the start date of the first sabbatical cycle that begins the year after sin entered the world, and we add 1,000 seven-year periods, we land on 3031 A.D., 7,000 years later, and 7,000 is surely divisible by 7, 1,000 times.